What do you call that noise? What do you call that noise? Andy Partridge has spent his whole career answering the same questions, and he's had enough of it. <laughs> this is the podcast where he gets to hear something different, and one where we get to hear another side of the XTC frontman. Hello, my name is Mark Fisher, and this is the second of two episodes of What Do You Call That Noise? The XTC podcast, in which Andy faces a more unusual form of interview. A few months ago, I gave the podcast supporters on Patreon the chance to ask questions they had always wanted Andy to answer that he never gets asked. As he put it himself, I am slowly withdrawing from doing interviews because I'm just kind of sick of the unimaginative nature of all the questions. Surely there are things people have always wanted to ask. His assessment of the Patreon supporter questions was positive. A couple of them are very confusing, which means I probably haven't heard them before. Indeed, the results are fascinating and fun. In part one, we heard Andy talk about the influence of art on his music. I cannot hear a piece of music without getting a picture. The Beatles song that is the closest fit to his personality. My brain is, is either out of control, scribbling, that's, that's neon coloured, and then the areas are very calm, just bobbing along. And the reason you won't hear him reading his own poetry. I don't have the kind of Richard Burton, mellifluous kind of sonority to my... You know, I, I sound like a bloody... I, I'm up in the hayloft, you know. And in this episode, you will hear him talk about self-doubt, recurring themes in his music, the fate of the Helium Kids demos, and a whole lot more besides. All that is to come. First, it's our regular slot in which we hear the kind of noise you've been making, and it's the turn this time of Chris Badley and Foolish Men to tell us about their xdc influence song, Mr. Scarecrow. What do you call that noise? Chris here from Foolish Men. Um, with Mr. Scarecrow, I was deliberately trying to write an Andy Partridge-style lyric. I wanted to capture that sense of mysticism and folklore that's so special to the flinty Wiltshire countryside. And of course, Scarecrow is a very XTC-type word, so I created a, a bit of a story about someone who was sentenced to life as a Scarecrow and banished to a remote field somewhere under a sort of curse. I sent the words to Dave, the musical half of Foolish Men, with a bit of direction about how I saw the music going. I mentioned tracks like Farm Boy's Wages, Harvest Festival, Summer's Cauldron and Rook. My mission as an XCC fan always being to show people that their best work came after Drums and Wires and Black Sea, especially the more pastoral stuff. And this is how Mr Scarecrow came about. Enjoy! Hey Mr Scarecrow, how long has it been? And tell me all the things that you have seen. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, what do you know? Tell me all the secrets from a long time ago. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, what's on your mind? And tell me why those people were so unkind. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, is it true that you just Vanished, vanished. Some people say they heard it said that you were really banished. They made a deal with the devil, and because of what you saw, you were cursed to be a scarecrow. Cursed to be a scarecrow. Cursed forevermore. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, all right and bone. What's it like to be so alone? Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, what do you say? You really don't give that much away. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, is it true that you just vanished? Some people say they heard it said that you were really banished. They made a deal with the devil, and because of what you saw, you were cursed to be a scarecrow, cursed to be a scarecrow, cursed forevermore. And so 
So the sun and the rain beats down on the crops And the cycle of the seasons just never ever stops The sweep of the scythe, the swing of the hoe Saving the harvest from the crow 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 Is it true that you just vanished? Some people say they heard it said that you were really banished. They made a deal with the devil and because of what you saw, you were cursed to be a scarecrow. Cursed to be a scarecrow. Cursed forevermore. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, won't you give us a song? You have been quiet for far too long. Hey, Mr. Scarecrow, what do you see? A man who looks just like me. What do you call that noise? Thanks very much, Chris and Foolish Men. You can hear more of their music on Spotify, and I'll include a link in the podcast blurb. If you have an XTC-inspired song yourself, feel free to let me know at mark at xtclimelight.com. A warning, though, that there is a long waiting list ahead of you. At this point in each podcast, I always give praise to the brilliant supporters on Patreon, but this time, these two episodes, more than any others, couldn't have happened without them and their brilliant questions. So a big, big, big thank you to all of you who asked Andy something, and of course, to all of you who just love supporting the podcast. If you'd like to do the same, all you have to do is go to patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher and decide on your level of support. There are three levels, and if you opt to be a knight in shining karma, I'll read out your name at the end of each episode. A reminder, you can buy your copy of What Do You Call That Noise, an XTC Discovery book at xtclimelight.com, where you'll also find details of all of the podcasts. So it's time to continue where we left off with Andy Partridge, part two. What do you call that noise? Well, let us carry on. Okay. I'm, I'm sat down and I plug my seating in. Very good. Um, so this one is... Two from Stephen Hope. Hi, Andy. Stephen Hope here in Glasgow, trying hard not to sound too Scottish for Mark's international listeners. Hope you are well, and thanks for soundtracking a huge part of my 56 years in the Garden of Earthly Delights, and for all the computer passwords. I'm still the proud owner of the signed Fuzzy Warbles box set, which I won on Mark Radcliffe's Radio 2 show back in 2000 and whatever. It sits next to the box set I actually bought with my own money. Anyway, to the questions. The first is, you once informed me on Twitter that broccoli was the king of vegetables. Do you still stand by that crazy notion? And also, which type of fruit tickles your taste buds the most? Hmm. And first of all, before we go any further, I have enormous, enormous Scots accent envy. <laughs> I would have, you know, because I've got the hayseed voice, the yokel voice, Man, when I hear that Scots accent, I just think, well, it's so unfair. I could have been a <laughs> Scot. Um, so, yeah, big on, big on the accent front there. Yes, broccoli. Broccoli. Uh, oh, Matt. Yeah, broccoli is still the king of vegetables. And um, there is a young pretender to the throne, which is the Brussels sprout. I, I love Brussels sprouts as well. But I still think... Broccoli is the lion king of veg. I still think he's at the pinnacle there. Um, you've got to go careful. If you're having a curry, it's got to be it's got to be a cauliflower, which is blander and more accepting of the curry flavour. 
Yeah, broccoli sort of wilts, doesn't it, under a curry? It, it, it yeah, and it's kind of, it, it fights back. It mm -hmm. fights the curry flavour too much, you know. So most things, broccoli, I think, is, is king of veg. I really do. I still do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, not to be I, overcooked though but if it, an overcooked broccoli is not I, a good I'm afraid because of my dire teeth situation um, I kind of almost have to have it overcooked now <laughs> you can suck it <laughs> yeah exactly through, through, a, broccoli. through a straw <laughs> 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 no it just has to be a little um, not, not so resistant uh, uh, to my denture um, no I don't have dentures honestly I don't uh, so, yes, broccoli is still the king of veg. Very and, good. Um, and there was I, an associated fruit question, I think, from Stephen there. I, again, because of the, uh, uh, because of the, I used to uh, eat about five apples a day at one point because of, uh, because the teeth are not so well behaved now. I, I tend to like fruit compote, which is, you know, cooking it down to a softer, sexy gelatinous mess and you can mix in apples and berries and fantastic so i'm 100 percent uh, converted to fruit compote very good um now stephen has a second question which echoes one of the questions earlier but it, it sort of takes it a little bit further my second question is xdc always put great care and thought into the running order of each album i can still recite them to this day but if there were ever to be a fight or a square go, as they say in Scotland, between the 12 opening tracks of an XDC album against the 12 closing tracks, and that fight could happen in a playground, ho-ho, who would win it? Does Snowman outpunch Peter Pumpkinhead? Would River of Orchids evaporate in the sacrificial bonfire? Can Beating of Hearts maintain a steady pulse after enduring some travels in Nihilon? Your verdict can be based on artistry, melody, band performance, production and legacy. In short, are you more proud of the way an XDC album started or how it ended? Anyway, thanks for that, Andy. Thanks for everything. Keep healthy. Stephen Hope in Glasgow signing off. Cheers, Stephen. Uh, that's the impossible... That's the impossible question because it really is like saying, of all your favourite feature films, which which opening scene was better than which closing scene it, it's <laughs> like i say you 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 either it, it's either the classic breezy opener with us which is crash bang wallop and you're in the door is kicked in and you're in the room or it's the the door is being slowly creaked open and you're taking a peek and you're you're looking at you know at summer's cauldrons like that uh, runaways is like that River of Orchids is like that, that slow, 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 getting you, putting your feet in the bath one toe at a time, you know. Um, and that sensation is difficult to square up against one of those tracks which can't be followed. The opening track is picked as uh, the sort of track that, invites following but the closing tracks are always picked as the tracks which shut the door mm -hmm. and it's come on out you're out it's closing time go slam you know there's no there's no more after that um and again they can be the gradual closing and hustling you out slowly slowly like the long fade uh, of uh, Last Balloon, which is intended to pan over to one side, by the way, in the same way that Hot Air Balloon will will drift past you. And the whole track, if you've noticed, sonically drifts off into one ear. Um, but that that is an impossible to follow track, I think. So that has to be the last track. Or the giant steamroller enders of things like um complicated game or travels in nihilon where you're you're really grabbed by the collar and thrown out of the pub at that point and the door is slammed you know so it it's it's almost impossible it's like saying red or green which is the most useful it's it's for what reason you want to use it if you see mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So it's a good question, but I would never think of getting them to to oil up and go in for a boxing match with each other. <laughs> Because one might be a, a, a little four-year-old girl and the other one might be a, you know, 20 stone behemoth of a man <laughs> with iron boxing gloves on. You know, it's just not going to be fair, is it? <laughs> so <clears throat> that's a tricky one, but I, I think I've answered it reasonably well. It's, it's what, is the, what is the reason that you're using that song? Yeah, yeah, and in that sense, it doesn't make sense to have a favourite because it's they're f- performing a different for function. a purpose. Yeah, it's yeah, put yeah. there. It's put there for a purpose. I mean, the songs weren't written to open or close albums, but you know, when you've written all the songs, and we tried, we used to try and record as many of the songs we'd written that everyone was okay with. We used to try and record as many as possible because we realised that some grew stronger and better in the studio and some could wilt under the lights. Uh, and if it wilted, you think, mm, maybe that's not quite as good as we thought in rehearsal, you know. Or if it grew, it'd be like, oh, this is great. This is, wow, this, this could be a closer track. or you know. And, and also some closers are to invite you to the next album. I always thought that Funk Pop Roll was an invitation to, hey, turn up to the Big Express, mm-hmm. if you see mm-hmm. what I mean. That that track is much more related to the Big Express than it is to the uh, semi pastoral nature of Mummer of the rest. Of, yeah, 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 I can see that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But that was the last number to be written, and uh, at that point in time, I was kind of no. Let me put the acoustic guitar down. Give me that electric. Crank it up. Come on. You know, it's it's. You're sick of blamange now. I want some. I want some pork. You know. <laughs> yeah um and at, at some point it's long what well, you know on my long list of podcast ideas uh, a, a a podcast episode about the first songs and another podcast episode about the last songs is is something i think i've mentioned this to, to Stephen already that um we should return to because uh, there's lots to be discussed just on those first and last songs because they're yeah. i think unlike i don't know if if every band does that but i, I think it is something that xtc always did Think about the first and last ones. Well, to me, as I say, it's all linked to the visual. Yeah. How do you get into the film and how do you close the film? Yeah, which makes the which makes the subject of of our videos even more painful because you know everyone I think by now knows that we weren't allowed to make our own videos, and uh, it's it's painful the the shit we had to suffer. <laughs> Well, there is actually a video question coming up, so I'll come back oh, to that. Oh, okay, I'll strap um, in for that one. Uh, meanwhile, by coincidence, we're staying in Scotland, this time with Murray Meikle. Andy, I recall reading uh, an interview with you in one of the music papers 40-odd years ago. It was one of these uh, interviews that was a, a Q&A, so you probably submitted your answers in, in writing. And one of the, the questions was, do you have a favourite word? And... Uh, if I recall correctly, the your favourite word at that time was nebulous. I'm just curious as to whether nebulous remains your favourite word or whether on your top 10 list of words it has been replaced at the top by another word, and if so, what that word might be. Again, great accent. Damn it, why couldn't I have that accent? I like the way that the Edinburgh, Edinburgh comes out. Yeah. I've noticed that over the years, Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nebulous isn't bad. Spermatozoa is excellent. It's the zoa bit on the end. It almost sounds like a very trendy kid's toy from the from the uh, the late eighties, early nineties. Spermatozoa, <laughs> something imported from Japan, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's all those big nebulous shapes that look a bit like a, a, a Miro artwork. What was that stuff called? Zola. I don't know what Zola is. I guess it was called Zola because I bought a set. I bought a set for Holly and Harry on a on a trip to the states. Um, I think I got it in um, yeah. FAO Schwartz. Yeah, so zo- a spermatozoa, lovely word. It's got a it's got a rhythm and a and a solidity to it. Not like the substance itself, but uh, mm-hmm. spermatozoa is good. Um, puff is quite a nice word. 
it's that it's one of those onomatopoeic words, isn't it? Puff. It's like zip, zip, <laughs> zip. puff. Yeah, I like I like onomatopoeic words. So yeah, okay, we'll go with spermatozoa. That, that's a very good one. Yeah, and it reminds me we've already been talking about poetry, but you do have a love of language. I do. I I, yeah. I think it's uh, indispensable. And um, <laughs> you use it every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use it. Every, never needs repair. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do like the language uh, very much. Um, I, I never, I never use very flowery language in my everyday life because I don't know anyone that would particularly appreciate it. But um, I do enjoy it when I hear it. Like, to me, when I hear Shakespeare, I think, that is gorgeous. I don't know what the hell they're saying, but the sound of it is like a beautiful vocal flower arrangement. Mm -hmm, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to make sense. It just has to be there. Yeah. Yeah. All those different blooms and different tendrils and the odd snail crawling up the vase. And, you know, they're, they're a bit like the sort of Dutch... Uh, still life type paintings um shakespeare to me is is like a display of words that a flower display doesn't mean anything it's just beautiful it's it's beyond meaning i'm having a, a, a sort of memory of being at school and if you used uh, a vocabulary that is, was even slightly wider than Everybody, all your classmates, you you could quite easily be picked on. Did that happen oh, yeah. to you? Would a bit, do people um, did did it feel uh, I don't know as if you were breaking rules by using a, a, a broader set of? No, words I I, would, I wouldn't have used it at school because a they wouldn't have known what the hell you were saying, mm -hmm. and you'd be talking Martian to them, and and after you'd be punched, you'd you'd be trying to talk Martian <laughs> through a mouthful of blood, you know. So I, I never, I kept it for the, the written place, you know. Yeah, well, but even in like the conversation we're having now that you've used, you just use the word tendrils. Most people don't use the word tendrils every day. You, 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 you. <laughs> well, they, they have the cheaper version. That five, <laughs> five tendrils is half the cost. Bargain basement partridge. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything must go. One brain cell at a time. <laughs> um, here's a question from Alison Eels. Hi Andy, this is Alison, and my question is, if you could put together an XTC jukebox musical, um, not so much about the story of the band, but about a theme that emerges across a number of songs, what songs would you choose and what do you think the theme would be? What might the story be about? Do you know, we must get asked about at least once a year to do a jukebox musical. You know, I, I'm, and everyone who comes up with the idea thinks it's a new idea. Mm -hmm. I'm considering doing a jukebox musical of XDCs. You know, can we talk about what we would do? And, uh, and I'm thinking, no, I just, I just, this is no reflection on our questioner. This is just the, the concept of jukebox musicals generally. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I, I did email Alison about this and, as I suspected, her question is as much it is not really about jukebox musicals. It's about the themes, and uh, yeah. if there is a kind of theme, if if you if you were putting together a collection of your songs or XTC songs, uh, and you wanted somehow to bracket them in a in a kind of these are the mm, songs that a, a particular theme was emerging from them. You see, it's difficult for me to disengage or disentangle the batches that these songs were written in and what I was going through, certainly in my life, when they were being written and what we were going through in our band life when they were being recorded. And then on top of that, you have the kind of the fact that the selection process has herded certain sheep in, into the pen and certain sheep towards the slaughterhouse. And it's a, a case of I I could grab any album that we made and it, it would have it would have all those things in it where my head was at at the time of writing, where our heads were at at the time of recording, 
what was going on with the producer, the record label, what was going on with our career. Was it was it written on beer mats in German hotel rooms or, uh, you know, on note paper in Irish hotel rooms? Was it was it written on the back of your hand in a van? Don't forget those two lines. They're really good. When we get some paper at the next stop, I'll write those down. Um, so you, you have all these things and, and a thousand more things. So it's very difficult to untangle the net of what's going on in our history at that time. Yeah. Uh, let alone the fact that certain albums are kind of um i hate this phrase uh because it never means anything they're kind of concept albums uh big express is kind of a concept album um skylarking is kind of a concept album mummer is kind of a concept they're they're all to do with like i say it's what's where your head is at at that time and and I suppose I wonder whether, like, you, it, it, in retrospect, they might sort of look like a concept album, even if you weren't particularly planning it to be a, a concept album at the time, because they'll they end up they'll end up being yeah. placed in, in that yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. but uh, artists not uh, not really necessarily you, but artists often do repeat themselves. They sort of uh, they're forever dealing with that same problem that they had when they were fourteen, and they never quite they, each. Each novel they write or each film they make is a sort of reenactment of it. I wonder if you found. Well, I'm, yourself... I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that. And and I, what would that subject be? Uh, well, can I earn enough to can I earn enough to to pay for the girlfriend, the wife, the family, the kids, yeah. the the mortgage, whatever it is. That was That's... the one on my mind actually, because you've. Well, got... there you go. That, <laughs> yeah. I, that I can't help that that keeps reoccurring time and time again. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is being out in the fields, out in the fields, out on the hills, out in the countryside, whereas Colin imagines what it's like in the parlor and in the front room and in the kitchen. And he has a, he has an, he's an out, I've said this a few times, but he's an outsore, out, sorry, an outdoor kind of fella that dreams of indoors, whereas <laughs> I'm an indoor kind of fella that dreams of outdoors. And so a lot of my songs is I'm I'm up on the hills or out in the field or wherever on at the seaside on the river you know I'm out in the open and and that to me is longing for the missing half and yeah. the same with Colin he's longing for his missing half I think yeah yeah and then very specifically you've got notes and in terms of money you've got notes and paper and iron notes and coins uh it's earn enough for us love on a farm boy's wages i think there's another one you know where, where and and maybe elements of other songs as well yeah 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 absolutely I, I i unless i had a sheaf of all of our lyrics here i just can't pull one to mind right now but you'll you'll see me fretting about earning enough mm-hmm. through the mm-hmm. entire career because we didn't we didn't uh, you know it's it's a it's a well run story that when we signed to virgin we were on 20 pounds a week i mean as a as an artist in the uh, in the McIlroy's department store painting their posters i think i was on 27 pounds a week at the time and when i became professional and signed to virgin records it went down to getting 20 pounds a week and i didn't or none of us realized it was our own money we were loaning and we would have to pay all that back as well as the cost of recording the album promoting the album pressing it up touring ba ba da 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 every cost going we had to pay all that back so and even before that none of you came from wealthy backgrounds none of you no, had no. trust funds no, none of three you could, of us. Yeah. All Three of you of had to were. earn a living. It wasn't a, yeah. whatever you were doing, you had to earn, earn a living. Actually, uh, XTC Mark I with Barry Andrews, and I think all four of us were council house kids. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Dave joined, he was from a, he was from a family whose uh, parents were teachers, and uh, he, he came from a, a village outside of Swindon called Purton. And... Um, I mean, we thought that was unusual. He was almost like a foreigner. What? You don't live on a council estate. Um, 
but it it's money has never been has never loomed large on the horizon um and if you haven't got it you don't particularly worry about it mm -hmm. I've, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and it's it's certainly nothing to do with happiness. I've been ecstatically happy with a one pound note in my when we still had one pound note with a one pound note in my back pocket, no bank account. And but I've been ecstatically happy. It's all circumstance, and it, usually the circumstances brought on by people and emotions that those people generate. It's not to do with, hey, I've got five pounds or, hey, I've got a thousand pounds or whatever. That, that doesn't make the happiness. It, it's usually the relationship with these people or this person and these things that are said and causing this emotion to happen. It's, happiness does not come from money. No. And, um, uh, well, yeah, you can, you, can, you can see it and, you know, is Bill Gates happier than the rest of us? I don't think he is particularly. I've never asked him, but <laughs> yeah, but he can, at least he can sit on top of a thousand foot high of dollar bills and cry. <laughs> um, what have we got next? Evan Fish has got two questions. Hey, Andy, I'm Evan from Wisconsin, and I have a question about how you deal with self doubt when putting your music into the world. Uh, how do you know what is worthy to record? And does it matter to you if people hear it or not? Like, is it better to just record music for yourself than to expect some sort of reception? Self-doubt. Yeah, um, tons of it. Um, and the, the secret is overwrite. You know, write 100 songs, pick, pick the 10 best ones, throw out the 90 not best ones, or less than that, pick out the five, you know, I always tried to write at least three, if not four albums worth for every album. And knowing that the others in the band and the record label and the producer management, blah, blah, whatever it was, would say, well, Andy, we like these six, seven songs, whatever. And Colin's written these four and we like those three of his. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it would be that the whittling down is savage. You know, you, you, you start with a forest and you end up with a box of matches and the rest has been whittled down to get that box of matches. So be prepared and expect to throw away as much as you can. Um, that's how you, that's how you distill the best stuff. And don't worry about if you, if you think shit, I really love, that bit of song A, and I really love that bit of song B, but I don't love the rest of those two songs, try sticking the good bit of song A with the good bit of song B, <laughs> even if you've got to change the key of one or both of them to work. You know, that can, that can have great results. You know, Senses Working Overtime was a case of Frankensteining some bits from other songs that weren't working. Um, and so be prepared to 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 be Dr. Frankenstein and sew that great set of arms onto those beautiful curvy legs from that song. <laughs> and yeah, that works, you know. This I'm, this I'm just thinking that question about self-doubt, I, I see it all the time in artists of all disciplines, which is that there's a there's a weird contradiction, which is on on the one hand, you need to be confident to go out there and sell your wares and tell people about this thing that you've done that you're really proud of and the other you're really um uh you're the opposite of that you're 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 very thin-skinned and and you're, you're you're not really capable of dealing with the criticism that might come your way <laughs> i totally agree but i i don't think in my life i've ever met a confident artist whatever the media is they're working in they're always fucked up that's mm -hmm. the nature of being an artist. You will be m a messed up person. And the only way you can get rid of your messed upness is to do that art, to write mm -hmm. that song, to paint that picture, to chip that sculpture. Um, and that's, it's, it's therapy. It's the therapy. The result uh, is, the, is the therapy for you, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And therefore, if somebody criticizes one of, 
your babies, it feels like they're criticizing you personally. Oh, uh, absolutely. Not, not the thing that you've yeah. emerged but from. You're not, you're not to worry about that because that's all a part of the, the throwing away process. You're going to criticize your own stuff. You have to criticize your own stuff a lot crueler than they ever would. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's nothing that anyone said about any song of mine that I haven't thought myself in a much more vicious way. I can be such a bitch about my own songs. <laughs> like, you know, it's, nobody's, nobody's said stuff about anything I've written that's as cruel as anything I've thought about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, sure, let them, let them go ahead because yeah. by the time it's got to being released, recorded and released, it's battle hardened enough. Did you become battle hardened? You know, particularly in the in 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 the early days of XTC when you were being reviewed in all the music papers and everybody was expressing their opinions, good, bad, indifferent, whatever. Did did that harden you up, that sort of reaction to to just sort of getting on with it? Yeah, it takes a long time. It takes a long time though, because you get your first few write ups and you think, Great, we've got it. We're being written about. And then you think, oh, that bitch, that's really <laughs> nasty to say that. Oh, fancy saying that. She wouldn't say that about The Clash or about whatever the band, you know. But why does she have to say that? That's real. That's not fair. You know, it's all that kind of thing. You have to yeah. go through that. It's You have to go through the beasting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and for some people, I, I've had reactions to, from people who you think are, are really, really established in their sphere of operation you know taking issue with something that somebody has written in a very very minor publication and you're kind of thinking why are they even reading that thing but but i think it's the same thing it's that uh sensitivity thin skinness to to any um to, to any criticism sure well it's because you're as i say to be an artist you have to be fucked up um and if you're not don't try and be an artist yeah because you, if you're too content, you you won't make great art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you're a happy person, I don't think you'll make great art. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be screwed around in the head with a lot of things to get rid of. And that process of getting rid of them is what fuels the fire of the art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think if you're all well-balanced and everything's great, go for a different job. D don't stay away from the... Stay away from the musical instrument or the paintbrush, sir, madam. Just <laughs> go and do something else. You know, get a, get a job on London Underground or whatever you want to do. But you know, <laughs> if you're happy, great. Um, but yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking. Yeah, but if you're so plagued with doubt that you can't even work on the London Underground, then you're really in trouble. <laughs> no, you'll be a great. <laughs> I think the next stop is Piccadilly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, if it's if that's okay with you. No, you can't. Uh, and something that chap touched on was you can't take into consideration what people think of your art. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds screwy to say that, but you really mustn't because you're not making it for them. You're making it for yourself. It's part of your therapy. Mm -hmm. You're getting rid of all that crap inside of yourself in a creative way. You're shaping that crap to be something, my God, it's human shit, but it's squeezed and pinched, and that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. But it's made out of human shit from inside of me because I was so hurt by mm -mm, or so confused by mm -mm, and how to express that, you know. and. Um, but you don't make you don't make your music for anyone else. If they like it, great, double win. Mm -hmm. But you you don't you if you sit thinking, mm, is anybody gonna is anybody gonna like this? I better I better make it more commercial. Though those things, in my experience, tend to tend to um, be a bit stillborn. The idea is to gently upset people. <laughs> and and uh, not to if you please them you will you will not grow the, and you only grow by leaving them behind mm -hmm. it's how the snake is how the snake travels you get m new people coming on at the head old people leaving off at the tail so that's how the snake moves along 
It's uh, it stays the same length, but you have people joining at one end and people leaving at the other, and it's the impression of movement. Evan goes on to ask a Paul McCartney related question. Do, do. Um, also, really quick, have you kept up with Paul's solo career, particularly his more recent stuff? And do you have any favorite albums or songs? His McCartney 3 album, for example, is so wonderful, and I love how he's settled into his old man voice. Um, anyway, thank you for the beautiful music, and thank you, Mark. Okay, that's a tough one, because I admire McCartney enormously. I think him and Ray Davis are probably my two favorite pop writers. Um but I, because of my age and my experience with the Beatles, to me, McCartney is locked in the 60s. And it's difficult to, it's difficult to get into anything outside of the breakup of the Beatles because at that point, I'm starting to make my own music, albeit stumbly and, 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 I think when you're making your own music, you've you've stopped taking the inspiration on board. You've taken all the inspiration on board before you start making your own. It's like you can't you can't shit and eat at the same time. It's very difficult. If you're if you're eating all the input, doing all the input. It's, oh, yeah, the new Beatles single, the new Kink single, whatever, the new album by blah, blah, blah. You know, you're putting all that stuff in, you're banqueting and on your influences. And then you're, oh, I can play guitar. Hey, I can write a song. Suddenly you're, you're shooting it out the other end. It's, it's not, it's not a process that you can do really well at this. It's not two processes. Is the plural proceeds? Oh, that's a good question. Processes. Processes. <laughs> Not proceeds. Don't know. So they, can, they can wrangle about this one for months. <laughs> um, it is the two different things uh, you don't do simultaneously. And I found that with a lot of favorite writers, uh, pop song writers. I, I stopped being interested in Brian Wilson when the Beach Boys hit the wall i stopped being interested in ray davis when the kinks hit the wall they'd already to me done the job of influencing me enough mm -hmm. and so that's that's a long-winded way of saying i never kept up much on mccartney and i have to disagree i i prefer his flute his piping flute voice of the younger mccartney and I can just hear the tuner. I can hear the tuner in the live performances. I can hear the tuner on the albums. And because he's, he's, he hasn't got that piping voice anymore. It's, it's maybe related to what I said earlier about you don't want to see fat 70 year olds staggering around who can't sing anymore. And, uh, you know, he's done his, he's done more than his fair share of wonderfulness. I don't need to hear. What is he now? Eighty something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. But hey, Jude, <laughs> I don't need to hear that. You know, I've got the record. The record's perfect. You know, so I no. That's a fancy way of saying I haven't really kept up with what McCartney does these days. No, and when I have heard it, I've thought to myself, "Fuck me, turn that tuner off." Sorry to disappoint you, Evan Fish. <laughs> well, yes, it was a good question. Yeah. And, uh, and I admire McCartney greatly. I would never, never hear a bad thing about, uh, about Beatle Paul. But um, like I say, once you stop taking it in and you're putting it out yourself, uh, I, I don't need the constant, I don't need the constant banqueting. Uh, great. Let's go to Rob Lawlor. Hi, Mark. Hi, Andy. And thanks very much for doing this. My name is Robert Lawler from Kildare in Ireland. I was just wondering, I was listening to an interview with Thomas Walsh recently, and uh, he was describing how the last thing he wanted to do sometimes was to pick up a guitar and play, that he'd rather do anything else. 
I'm just wondering, not quite writer's block, but I'm just wondering, Andy, did you ever go through anything like that where you thought, oh, listen, the last thing I want to do is pick up an instrument here. But despite that, there's some compulsion to go ahead. Um, so, listen, thanks very much for doing this. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Um, yeah, oh, interesting you mentioned uh, Thomas there because uh, a few months ago I, I had a Zoom songwriting session with thomas and we came up with about half a dozen ideas for for new songs and uh, hopefully thomas is chiseling away at those those ideas now um he was talking about going on a tour of people's living rooms in the u.s i don't know whether that happened or not but the last thing i remember is is uh, him leaving with half a dozen ideas under his arm of of new songs um very talented man Thomas. Uh, yes, I've, I've been in that place where the last thing you want to do is music. Uh, and I find that the thing I miss the most is the deadline. I've got nobody ringing up saying, come on, we want a new album in two weeks' time. And, you know, if you don't write that new album, you don't eat. It, you, don't, you can't buy groceries, you know. I miss that. Or I miss the stimulation of a really interesting deadline. Oh, we'd like you to write the theme for this show or this film. Uh, we need it in, in two weeks. Or, you know, the, the last really big one for me was being asked um, by the, the Disney people to write for James and the Giant Peach. And so thrilled was I about being in the great company of other Disney songwriters because there have been some real giants, you know, that have written for Disney cartoons and, and films and stuff. I so excited was, oh, yeah, I could be part of that stellar company as opposed to stellar street. Um, so that for me was the, the deadline of that. You know, can you, we'll need these songs. We'd like maybe four songs. One where he's sad and on his own and he's wishing for something he can't have. One where blah, blah, blah. You know, they give you the scenario they want. And so thrilled was I to be asked that I came up with, um, I think, five songs in, in a week. And I demoed them really quickly and sent them off. And then, of course, I got to see the contract, which was abysmal. And they wanted a, a total buyout. So you don't get any royalty. You got four thousand dollars was it i can't remember four thousand dollars per song which at the time was probably about two thousand pounds per song and that was it you never saw a cent ever again for any reason no matter what they did with those songs or where they went or and i thought this is just not good enough and i bet elton john never agreed to that um so i said no because i thought ultimately it was a shit deal uh, and I I put up my part of the bargain. I, I wrote, gave them the four songs I, I thought they wanted, and they seemed very happy with them. Um, uh, but the deal was so poor that I said, no, I'm not doing it. That's just, that's just not good enough, you know. Uh, because that's one of the things in life I've had to learn to say is no. I was uh, Mr. Happy Puppy saying yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes to everything. What you want to fuck me in the ass with a stainless steel pineapple? Yes, <laughs> you know it's. It, and I was too much of that, and I, it was injuring me. So I can say no a little easier these days. But I do miss deadlines. I do miss you know. Come on, we've got the studio booked. Uh, have you got the new album ready? You know, I I, I do miss that. Um, so if I get a deadline that I think is a worthy thing a good thing to be involved in, I can really respond to it. So, um, yeah, deadlines are good. I think it was, uh, oh, who was the, was it Count Basie? Count, it might have been Count Basie. They say, why, what do you, why do you, how do you get inspired for you? He said, fuck inspiration, just give me a deadline. And it's, <laughs> tr it's true. You know, you can, yeah. when you've got this weight pressing on your head, you can do any you can do wonders just to get the weight off your head so uh, deadlines are beautiful 
but like even today you've still got a guitar sitting around your your the, the guitar is still an instrument you like and that we're attracted to there it is i can play the opening chord to ballad of peter pumpkinhead <laughs> Yes, the acoustic version of Peter Pumpkinhead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, right, well, let's get on to another question. This one is from Swindon and from Jamie Dunn. Hi, Andy. I hope you're happy and well. I really enjoyed listening to the recent Strong Songs podcast that did a wonderful and affectionate deep dive into River of Orchids. To my shame, though, it occurred to me how long it had been since I'd last listened to those final two albums. And this is all because the bulk of my music is enjoyed when I'm out and about and using streaming sites. Now, I totally understand and support the reasons why they've been withheld, but I wonder if the passage of time has shifted the thinking to the many new fans who may not get to hear those wonderful songs. More than most bands, I'd like to think that the kind of person who loves XTC music will seek out those reissues from Burning Shed or find other ways to support the band financially. Anyway, if you get to hear this question, then thank you for listening and all the best, pal. Well, initially, it was Colin and myself that didn't want the last two albums put on sites like Spotify and stuff like that. Uh, And my attitude has softened over the years, but Colin still doesn't want them put onto those sort of platforms, so I've got to respect that. He doesn't. He doesn't want his not point not 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 one. Exactly. Penny. Yeah. He doesn't want his one millionth of a penny. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, those deals on those streaming and download sites. They're they're worse than old back of cigarette packet blues man's contracts. You know, <laughs> they're a lot worse than those. Um, but like I say, I mean, maybe I should maybe I should fish with Colin a bit more and say, you know, have you softened a little on the the whole Spotify type thing? Because people do complain quite a lot that they they can't get those songs. Um, yeah, so I'll look into that a little more. But I, I'm quite open to it now. Well, I wasn't at one time, but I've softened on that now. That's a, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I imagine your naught point naught 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 one p is better than nothing. If that's the only alternative, there there isn't yeah. a viable alternative. Well, I'm glad he likes the last two albums. Most people, it's either oh well, last uh, last album wasn't any good because Dave's not on it. They don't realise that literally ninety percent of the things that I played were the things that Dave thought up before he left, and it would have played. <laughs> Yeah, he would have played, yeah. The reason we didn't use Dave's playing was we were either having a bitch attack and thinking, well, he's walked off, so we're not going to use his playing, or um, we recut the tracks with Chuck Sabo, and what Dave played was the right parts, but in the wrong timing because we'd recut the tracks. Uh, and I I largely played what Dave uh, worked out, you know, things like... Well, a lot of the parts on a lot of the songs are exactly what Dave had, was playing. Mm-hmm. So when people say, oh, it's no good. Andy's playing is not very good. I think you'll find I'm playing what Mr. Gregory wanted played. Um, but, but people have got funny, funny ideas. They, a lot of people either, they either think because Dave wasn't around for the end of, um, for the end of, uh, of, um, uh, the ship, I, I've gone. I'm having a Biden moment. <laughs> XTC was the band you were in, Grandad. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, no. Um, Wasp star. Uh, not no, not Wasp star. Sorry. Uh, Apple uh, Venus. Apple Venus. I got there in the end. Um, yeah, they either think that the the because Dave left in the latter half of uh, recording and mixing that. They think, oh, there's, there must be some fault with that album, and it's too soft, it's too gentle and acoustic, damn it. And then, uh, like I say, they have this thing, well, oh, well, Dave's not on on uh, Wasp Star, so therefore it can't be any good. But like I said, it, I'm just playing what he wanted played. Uh, and I still don't totally know why he left the band. I really don't. Um, but... Um, when we finished up with our questions today, I should really get, I, I have a little mental list of questions that I would, I would have liked people to have asked me. <laughs> yes, they, 
Yeah, and oh, well, you did do that corrector thing on on Twitter at one point, didn't you? As, as yeah, well, well trying to just trying to put straight the the bullshit that's out there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, because so much bullshit on the net, that people just make stuff up, <laughs> and then other people believe it. Yeah, and then that's the worst that then gets into circulation. Yeah, it then becomes it's holy writ. You know, mm-hmm. now it becomes chiselled in stone. Oh no, this is how it was. <sighs> I kill them. <laughs> um, here we I mentioned we mentioned earlier videos, and here is your video question from Adrian Loon in Australia. Hi, Andy. Adrian here from Tasmania, Australia, where we're less about the Taz and more about the mania. I've got a question about the only music video that you were ever one hundred percent satisfied with: the Mole from the Ministry by the Dukes. What I'd really like to know is who was having such an outrageous time in that panto horse? Cheerio. Good question. Um, I think that the pers- people in the panto horse were two of the BBC crew um, because it was the film was made for uh, a BBC West of England program. Um, Oh, God, was it called RPM? I think it was made for a show called RPM. That rings a bell. Yeah. And uh, they said, well, you've done you've done the, this this Duke's record. Um, why don't we make a video for it? And we said, well, we can't really afford it, you know, because they'll only charge us to, well, we'll do it for nothing. We can get the use of the camera team for the day and we'll just hang around and, and have some fun and, do you think you'd like to do? Yeah, yeah. It's got to look like every every promotional film from 1967, 68. It's got to look like all of those smashed together. You know, dollop of the Beatles, dollop of Pink Floyd, a bit of the monkeys, a bit of this, that, and the other, whatever, thrown in there. And it was the only it was the only video that we made where we were allowed to have what we wanted which was, you know, that, that's the, the look of it that we wanted. Whereas every other video, while we were with Virgin Records, um, there was a woman called Tessa. Tessa, oh, Tessa Watt, or Watts, I think was her name. She was a very disapproving stern individual and i would bring into the office reams of paper and card where i'd storyboarded what i would like for any video for any given song that they picked they always picked the singles so we didn't get to choose the singles they always chose the singles uh and i foolishly would then storyboard a video go in to see tessa um, and I would go in with these under my arms and she said, well, what have you got there, Andy? Well, here's the, uh, here's the video I've got for the, uh, the idea for the new video. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't need to get all that out. Uh, we've got, uh, we've, we're paying so-and-so and so-and-so limited. To, they're the hot shit video people of, of, at the moment, and they're going to be doing it for you. Oh, and, uh, all you have to do is you have to turn up on Saturday at this address at this time in the morning and uh, do what they say. Oh, so that was how all of our videos went um, largely, apart from um, apart from the Mole from the Ministry, where that was done sort of sideways of Virgin. Of course, Virgin got to use it, um, even though they didn't pay anything for it, but they got to use it, and uh, so our, our tale of um, our, our tale of videos is is a very sad one, as far as I'm concerned. I came up with a lot of ideas for these videos, which oh no no you can't do that you can't do that that's nonsense who'd who'd want to do a black and white film on on color television nobody would show it and then people go and win awards for black and white videos <laughs> who'd want to have an animation 
of uh, they want to see the band. They don't want an animation. Then someone goes and wins an award for an animated video. Oh, no, they you can't show musical instruments underwater. What with children watching, electricity, water, terrible. And then somebody goes and makes a video where they're underwater. Oh, man, the whole history of it is, I just, it was so depressing because I'm such a visual, a visual person to have all these visuals smacked down by this disapproving cow was <laughs> really painful. <laughs> and I can say that because um, she's now looking up at us from down there. So, uh, yeah, she's passed on to the realm of negating what Satan wants to make a video of. <laughs> Here is Steve Chris Manning. Hi Andy, this is Steve Chris Manning from Holmes Chapel in Cheshire. And my question is, would you ever be tempted to re-record the back catalogue pre-white music? Those wonderful songs by Star Park, Helium Kids and early XTC to a sonic clarity worthy of commercial release. I do hope so, because I would be the first to purchase it. Thank you. What a beautifully asked and thoroughly kinky question. <laughs> because those songs were, those songs were crap. They really were. Um, they were noisy. There's nothing wrong with that. But they were just crass, and they were shallow copies of other bands. I didn't know how to write songs. I didn't know my own songwriting mind at the time. Um, and, and I just, it's a bit like, do you, would you like it if we got really high res quality uh, billboard size pictures of you at the age of 13 covered in white heads? <laughs> naked <laughs> or in really bad flares with enormous collars and a layered haircut looking like all of Slade, you know, would, would you like it if we then put those up on gigantic billboards in Piccadilly Circus? No, you'd feel very unhappy about that. And I feel that they're the same thing. They're stumbling, bumbling, learning to some extent in public, but thankfully they were never commercially released. So they they never got to, they never got to escape into the wider firmament. So the answer really is it beautifully asked question, but the answer is no. <laughs> I, I I shudder at the thought. Actually, I have considered it, but it just went fleetingly through my head for a, for a few minutes, thinking, yeah, how would I do that? How would I? And then I start thinking about the material, thinking, oh God, the lyrics to that are so degradingly amateurly stupid um so no i think a nice a nice big brass gold plated no is the <laughs> and uh from the tone of your answer i imagine that would also apply to you know clear cleaning up the existing demo tapes such as they are and 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 releasing whatever that is uh well the the only things pre pre um uh, pre-released XTC material. The only stuff we've got are a few demo sessions for um, C CBS, I think, is uh, one of the sessions. I don't still think we have the Pi sessions around anywhere. Don't know if we've ever had those. Um, no, again, it's it's the same it's the same excuse. They're they're generally rotten songs uh, that I'm not proud of. But when we get to recording, the journey, the recording journey, I get more and more proud and more and more I would stand behind what we wrote and what we recorded. Mm. And, well, yeah. Also, also, there's a reason that, that you recorded what you recorded and you didn't record what you didn't record. It was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you probably would have said the same in 1978. Nature's way of saying. <laughs> um, a question from Steve Swift coming up. Hi, Mark. 
Hi, Andy. This is Steve from Leeds. My uh, question goes back to the 20th of May, 1978, when XTC appeared on the first um, show of the ill-fated Revolver programme, which was produced by Mickey Most and had a Peter Cook um, remotely comparing. Uh, on the same show, he introduced Kate Bush as Basil Brush's sister, uh, and you performed This Is Pop. Um, and I was there in Birmingham, uh, bouncing up and down at the front with uh, mop hair and spots. Anyway, um, a few days earlier, I'd seen um, Talking Heads, and I marvelled, and I can remember thinking how similar your stagecraft and mic presence was to David Byrne. Was there any conscious um, copying or uh, observations involved in how you perfected your on-stage persona at that time? Thank you. That's a, a question I've been asked before, um, but all I can say is I was largely, largely, apart from having the single love goes to a building on fire, uh, I had that when that came out. I don't know how I got hold of that, um, but I had that. And uh, I went to see them when they supported the Ramones on a, a tour of England. I went to see them when they played Swindon. And to be frank, I th they bored me. Uh, I thought, my God, this is like sort of like the Straubs or some sort of folk rock or something. I'd, at that point in, in time, I, I just wanted the Ramones, you know. I just wanted a, a solid wall of fuzz uh, with moronic lyrics. I just, to me, that, that was like an art form, that a, a newly arrived art form. Uh, and I didn't like. I grew to like talking Talking Heads more as the years went on, until the split. Um, but uh, no, I I think because David Byrne is somewhere on the spectrum, I, I which I am on as well. I I've never been properly tested, but uh, I I know that um, I know that I'm somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, and he and I got on very well together when we toured, and I don't know whether it was a like-minded thing. Uh, I, I certainly didn't copy him in any way. I know that, and I don't know whether he would admit it, but I know that Colin did for a while, and I think that's very evident on Colin's songs on Go To. Uh, I can hear David Byrne, um, you know, going, down the fire escape! <laughs> and uh, so I know that Colin was probably subconsciously influenced by, you know, because you'd go and watch all their gigs, you're touring together and you've just finished your set, you've toweled down, you put on a fresh T-shirt. Well, let's go and see what the heads are doing tonight, you know. And uh, so you, you, you have to soak in something, surely. But uh, I, I think I was more of a, nervy nerdy kindred spirit with david byrne than 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 a copier um i think if anything i'm more conscious of copying some of the earlier devoisms uh, which i grew very tired of very quickly um but it's it's like because it's kind of quasi humor it it wears out quickly but i i thought i was probably more influenced by slightly by by the devo thing um but to me i thought i was inventing a new way of singing i thought i was putting together the the kind of nervy buddy holly thing and the, the, the that hiccup thing of early rock and roll because i i wanted early xtc to sound like we were coming out of the speakers on a on a bumper car or dodgems circuit you know, they'd always be playing old 50s rock and roll, inevitably Johnny and the Hurricanes material. <laughs> you know, it'd be very distorted and fuzzy, and you sat in the bumper car whizzing around, trying to catch the eye, eye of the girls watching on the side, trying not to get ripped off by the teddy boy taking your fare. And your the soundtrack of all this thrill is this cheesy, cheap organ sound, and this this kind of strange space rock and roll, and to me that is how that that was a mental template for early XTC. 
And I thought I was just singing like a combination of Buddy Holly, maybe a, a sprinkling of Steve Harley yowling, ow, ow, in there as well, you know, um, because I knew I had a shit voice and I thought I've got to be memorable. So I'm going to put together to me the things that I think are memorable. And there's probably also practical things, perhaps, where, you know, if, if you oh, yeah, absolutely the staccato thing and a certain pitch and all that kind of thing. One hundred percent. Shitty PA systems mean you cannot sing E noises. You have to sing O noises because they can be heard. But E noises just turn into <laughs> and that's it. You don't get heard. <laughs> so that was very much, that was very um, inspirational, the practicality of being heard. Um, so a combination of all those things. But I was not especially influenced by by david byrne uh and i don't think he by i uh, or you know i know there was a two-way street at some point because i did the the track uh paper snow for the heads um album when when david and the talking heads split he and i retained quite a uh quite um a sort of pen pal thing for a few years if ever I was in New York, he'd I'd get together with him. We'd have lunch or dinner or whatever. And um, I started the very silly rumor, which I feel very guilty about, that he was a scatologist. Um, <laughs> and I started this rumor amongst uh, the inky music papers in England. I said, yeah, if you get to talk to that David Byrne, you get him to, you, you want to see him really excited, get him to talk about scatology. And uh, <clears throat> they did actually, several people asked him, is it true that you're really, really into scatology in a big way? And, it, you know, Dave, I think David forgave me. He, he went along with the gag for a while, but um, I hope I didn't cause him too much anguish. The, uh, well, the other um, story connected with Talking Heads is that you, from very early on, have always maintained that you were the person who invented the title, More Songs About Buildings and Food. Totally. In Chris, oh. in Chris Franz's memoir, he claims that it was them that invented it. So well, he did stick into your guns. I, I don't think he heard. Um, we were in a, we, it was a, it was a college or a university in Holland. It was somewhere like Groningen or, you know, the kind of the, the Birmingham's of Holland or whatever. It was, um, and, the dressing room was a big communal room. It was something like where they ate their lunch or something. And that was, uh, it was this big room and everybody, there was no screens or anything. You just had to get changed there. I think we got hustled out when, um, when I think their tour manager hustled out when, uh, what's her name? Tina wanted to get changed. <laughs> Sadly, you know, but, um, no, we finished and we watched their set and then they finished and they were toweling down. And uh, there's several events I remember from, from then from, from backstage I remember was David, David Byrne had a bright yellow uh, shirt on like a button down sweatshirt type thing with buttons and a collar, very preppy looking, you know, and he was taking cocaine. He was snorting a line of cocaine off of a mirror. And I thought, fuck me. That's, uh, that's the first time I've ever seen anyone doing that. Uh, of course, you know, we couldn't afford that and we probably wouldn't have done it. We would have spent the money on beer, you know? <laughs> uh, so that was, that was shocking from a, a little, little boy from a council estate uh, in Swindon. That was really shocking to see someone snorting cocaine. And then he asked me, he said, uh, Andy, we were just doing our, our new album. We don't have a title. Uh, what would you call our What would you call our new album? And I said facetiously, well, on the on the strength of the previous one, I said, uh, "How about more songs about buildings and food?" And he was giggling his ass off. He thought that was really comical. And if if anyone else overheard that, I think there was quite a lot of joviality about it. I said it in a in a sort of facetiously comical way, <laughs> and it and sounds then, exactly like the sort of thing that you would say. It sounds like an Andy Andy Partridgeism. Yeah. Then bugger me, the album comes out and it's called "More Songs About Buildings." 
<laughs> but of course, Chris, what's his name? Chris France is going to say, oh, it was us that thought it. You know, you can't have, no, it was that kid from Penn Hill, <laughs> Exeter State, who'd never seen anyone taking drugs before, thought of it. <laughs> I, I'm not telling you a lie here. I, no, I, I'm on your side. Um, I did think of that time. <laughs> we have the final two questions from Amy Parkinson. First off, thank you, Mark, for pulling this together and for all the love and care that you put into curating this wonderful podcast. Second off, hi, Andy. It's your friend Amy waving to you from sunny California. I have two questions for you. If you could jump into a pool of anything at all, what's in the pool? <laughs> that question. <laughs> can I can I answer this and still still say stay the right side of censorship? You've always already used the word spermatosa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it'd be a pool of breasts, <laughs> and I'd die of guilt because I'm a married man. Um, oh man, I love tits. Uh, stop it, Andy. Stop it. Uh, yeah. So there you go. It it would be in a, in a pool of breasts. Uh, very um, good. And here comes the final question. And two, if you could jam out and, I mean, with joyous abandon with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? I look forward to hearing your answers. And I also want to say thank you, Andy, for all the music um, that's been such a friend to me all these years um i'm starting to toy around with writing songs myself now and you inspire me in a lot of ways but in one big way and that's your wild creativity so i know i speak for everyone here when i say you are a fascinating gem of a person big big love and giant hugs to you mr partridge oh thank you amy um but who would I jam with? Well, this is, it would have to be the people that thrilled me the most as a guitar player. Um, and they would be Ollie Halsell, Peter Ollie Halsell, H A H A L S A L L. I think that's how you spell it. Why, why, why is that not branded in my synapses? Uh, Ollie Halsell, um, wonderful, wonderful, fluid guitar player that could just fly like like a really surreal skylark or something, hovering over the downs there. Just he would play runs and chords and combinations of things I've never heard any other player play. Um, you know, I've heard. A thousand and one players sound a little bit like this blues player or that rock player or this jazz player. I've never quite heard anyone take off like Ollie Halsell can. Um, and to think that he was in a he was in the band Tempest um, uh, with um, oh God, what's his name? I'm a late comer to this, so it's he's still quite a new player. Um, no, I'll stay with Ollie. I'll stay with Ollie. Um, so yes, Ollie Halsell. Just uh, and and sadly, I did meet him once at um, when we were. It was the last day of filming for that uh, session at the Manor for Towers of London, and somebody had invited Ollie to the party, and he was there with. To be frank, I think with two hookers, one on each arm, and he was staggering across the lawn. And I thought, oh, my God, is my guitar heroes walking towards me? What do I say, if anything? You know, because I, I didn't want to just do that thing where you just go, bah, 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 bah. I like your music. You know, I didn't. But I ended up pretty much going, bah, 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 I like your music. And he said, oh, yeah, I, uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I took something I, I I'm tripping at the moment. Oh, yeah, nice one. Uh, and he wandered off. You know, he didn't know what planet he was on, sadly. So I met my hero, and I don't – he was struggling with, with walking, let alone flying. Um, but he was a wonderful player when he was alive. I think, I think the drugs killed him eventually. So him and uh, 
I, I would, of course, like to sit with Jimmy. Uh, that's not Jimmy Edwards. That's Jimmy Hendrix. Um, just to have picked his brain a little. And the same reason with a, a young John McLaughlin, who was, uh, who was very formative for me. Um, and, and John McLaughlin has only recently stopped playing live. He's very advanced age now, but he's only recently just stopped. And he's, uh, because he's devoted his whole life to playing live, it's like, my goodness, uh, are you going to do that thing where you retire and then just fall to bits because you're, you're not doing exactly the same thing you've done all your life, you know? So, so him and Jimmy and Ollie Housel, they would be the three I would really like to, to sit and gently spar with, but they'd all wipe the floor with me. I, that, I was kind of, I wasn't thinking specifically that, but I was thinking about the intimidation of being on, uh, in the same room with, with your heroes, whether you just sort of seize well, them I, together. I, I'm sure I've told you many times I did have the chance to meet McCartney and Bowie in the same room. It was the war child. Uh, I'll just reiterate it once more. Uh, the war child people uh, wanted a, a picture for, um, you know, during the Bosnian War, they wanted a picture to auction off to send money. And uh, I did something and it got auctioned off and I got invited. Brian Eno invited me to uh, this art gallery in East London. And they said, um, oh, you'll be in good company. Uh, David Bowie and Paul McCartney are there. And, oh, for God. <laughs> so, so. so I agreed to go along. And Erica and I went along and we met up with some friends at, you know, at a restaurant before. And I said, look, I'm going to need a drink. I don't think I can go to two of my biggest heroes, songwriting heroes, in the same room stone cold sober i can't do it you know i need dutch courage here a few a few tons a few gallons of dutch courage and uh you know what happened inevitably i got so drunk i didn't care about going <laughs> but i just couldn't have gone and stood there with david bowie to the left of me and paul mccartney to the right of me i i just would be again it would be blah 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 blah, blah, blah you know so uh, i didn't want to put myself in that position and the only chance, the only other chance of, of meeting McCartney was in Air Studios, him walking along the corridor and me walking along, him and Linda walking along the corridor, very narrow corridor, and me going up the same corridor to go to the loo. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't avoid meeting McCartney. So I just dived into the first studio door I found, and Japan were in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, lads. Uh, yeah, wrong door. Uh, yeah. And I thought, oh, you must be gone by now. I can go out again, you know. <laughs> so, I, so I did. I went out. Now, meeting your heroes, you shouldn't really meet your heroes. It's, um, you know, hopefully if anyone's met me and I, I've been a hero to them, I, hopefully I haven't disappointed them. But I, I, I just didn't want to turn into a blathering idiot, which I would have done. Those are all the questions. Thank you very much for answering them all. I think the, well, not just the patrons, but the patrons will be particularly delighted. But um, I think everybody's going to be really fascinated. And and and, and you can now uh, assess the questions overall. By the end of all of those, were you a bit asked new questions or? Yeah, they were. Good. Some of those were tough because they came from an angle that you don't think about much. You know, uh, like being being asked. Actually, no, it wasn't tough. Being what would I jump into a pool of? Uh, that that one was. You've was clearly only, thought about that one a lot. <laughs> there was only one word in my brain. Everything else disappeared, you know. I, I enjoyed those questions today. That was great. That was good fun. Good. Thank you. That'll, that's maybe your definitive interview, but it's been really interesting. <laughs> interesting <laughs> because of the questions and because of the, the, yeah. the answers, it just makes, uh, you know, I've yeah, heard, heard and learned a lot. It could well be the definitive interview. Yeah. Now I'm a little horse. So... <laughs> uh, uh, I think there is a beer in the house. I may have it, but um, thanks for that. That was enjoyable. Thank you very much, Andy. It's been great. Yeah. And thanks for all the questioners. That was really good. What do you call that noise? All good things come to an end. Thank you, all of you Patreon supporters, for your great questions. And thank you, of course, to Andy Partridge for being so generous with his time and interesting with his answers. 
thanks this time to Chris Badley and Foolish Men for the music. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and are deeply envious of the people who got a chance to ask questions, please show your support at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. It'd be great to have you on board. Thanks in particular to the following knights in shining karma. Terry Arnett, Kevin Burt, Lorenzo Charchi, Kale Corbett, Liam Duggan, Jamie Dunn, Alison Eels, Jeff Farris, Evan Fish, Leslie Gooch, Mike Grafe, Robert Graham, Camille Henry, Stephen Hope, Alan Hughes, Marek Krauss, Jesper Cumberg, Robert Lawlaw, Adrian Loon, Liz Lynch, Murray Meikle, Yusuf Murrah, Amy Parkinson, Mark Reed, James Reimer, Michael Sutcliffe, Steve Swift, Mark Thomas, Nigel Waller, John Wedemeyer, Lucy Verbitsky, Martin Whitley. That is all for now, but we'll be back again with another great What Do You Call That Noise? The XTC podcast very, very soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>